Thank you, Marlies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the entire SAGES community. Um, I'm particularly honored to be here with you today, and I would like to pay back this uh, honor with showing for the first time the results of the ESCO trial uh, after three years of closing the, the, the trial. So I have nothing to disclose. I'm particularly eager of this topic because, as you might know, Stent Bridge to Surgery was initiated in uh, Italy, 1992, by Dr. Spinelli. It took some years before it got accepted, and uh, about 15 years later, when it started to be a routine procedure in many parts of the world, from Asia, the first reports uh, showed very bad oncologic results of those patients. In this, patient, in this paper by Dr. Kim, you see very bad oncologic results of 35 patients re retrospectively analyzed, analyzed and compared in a one to 10 ratio with similar staged patients that were not obstructed. It was 2009 and just after that, the Dutch trial Stentin 2 was closed, uh, coordinated by Janine Van Oft because of bad oncologic results and very high rate of morbidity after stenting. So the atmosphere was bad. And this brought very shortly to recommendations from the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, where you see colonic self-expandable metal stents were substantially banned to be used as bridge to surgery, if not in very rare cases uh, uh, related to high, mortality, or high potential mortality of patients uh, if they would have, uh, have undergone sur surgery. This is a very uh, typical debate since then. It started already after this publication of these recommendations in Asia, uh, a high debate that uh, uh, produced this, this letter to endoscopy by Dr. Kim, who argued that this is still to be debated. We cannot have a final uh, position on that because actually of the eight randomized trials so far, two were closed showing a benefit for emergency surgery, but one was closed for a clear benefit of the stenting group. And it was in this atmosphere that I started in 2008 in Turin, under the uh, direction of uh, Professor Morino, my chief, the ESCO trial. ESCO stays for enteral stent for colonic obstruction. We wanted to assess mortality, morbidity and mortality at 60 days. If I would start the, the, the trial again today, I would probably choose a different outcome as primary outcome. But we, this was useful to understand with a short uh, cohort what was the uh, real results of these patients. We stratified those patients by PT and also by center. And we enrolled the patients only after uh, performing a CT scan to confirm the diagnosis of neoplastic obstruction. And uh, assuming a, um, a complication rate uh, of about 35% after emergency surgery and only 15% after uh, bridge to surgery, which resulted afterwards very much underestimated, we uh, decided to include 72 patients per group, which were randomized in five centers, mainly three actually enrolled patients, as you see. The entire thing lasted nine years almost, and here are the results. We had a success rate of about 80% clinically, 87% technically, but we have a high rate of dropout, as you see here, and this is the first, and in my opinion, one of the most important things that uh, the, sh the study shows. It is confirmed that CT scan does not allow you to have more than an 85% accuracy in diagnosing uh, aneoplastic uh, obstruction in these patients. And this is not just a matter if you have to deal with diverticulitis, nobody would uh, 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 sue you if you would operate those patients. But what about if you have uh, CD colitis? What about if you just have a stool impaction? So the first question that I pose to the audience today is, should we always perform endoscopy at first in these patients, even when we decide that we don't want to stent them? And pro probably the answer is yes. As I said, about three years ago, we 
we finish the enrollment of the patients. I don't want to go too much into details. Believe me that the patients' characteristics which were absolutely overlapping between the two groups. And the, the stent success rate, as you see, is reported here. I already mentioned that before. Uh, of course, types of surgery were distributed in a non-homogeneous way because Hartman procedures, subtotal colectomy, washout and anastomosis were much more frequent in the emergency surgery group, which in some way should influence also the quality of life of these patients, but this was not done in our study, unfortunately, although declared at the beginning. Complications, which was the primary outcome, as you see, is absolutely overlapping, much more uh, rated than we expected, about 50% and 50 and 60% in the two groups, but with no difference between the two groups. And also the distribution of complications is uh, um, almost homogeneous, I would say, between the two groups according to the Interclavian classification. Same goes for the complications at one year. And what about the follow-up? This is the novelty here. We lost six patients at follow-up during the three years, more than the censored, of course, and these are the survival curves. As you see, I don't think we need to comment that the oncologic results, both for survival and disease-free, are absolutely overlapping. I hate to use the word trend when we deal with statistics, but let me say that it seems like stents even behave a little bit better in the long run in terms of disease-free survival. But this is not statistically dif different, of course. And what about recurrences? You see here 15 recurrences in the stent group, stented group compared to 20 in the emergency surgery group. So again, no statistical significance at all. Does adjuvant therapy play a role in this? I wouldn't say that, because we had six patients in the stent group and 10 in the emergency, stent, uh, in the emergency surgery group that did not go adjuvant therapy, although they should have, but this is absolutely overlapping in the two groups. So one question could be, is it, is it stenting itself that generates some on oncologic concerns? Is it that the maneuver responsible of some oncologic uh, uh, failure in the long run? Let's have a look at the complicated and uncomplicated cases separately. If we take in, into consideration only the uncomplicated patients, so those that really performed well, they had a stent, they had stool passage, they were operated electively, actually they behave exactly the same way of those that had emergency surgery and did not have complications. So I would rather say that stenting itself doesn't represent an oncological issue. The problem is you may perforate. And in our series, we had five patients who were perforated, actually. And I'm not here to say that compared to other studies, those patients did not develop any recurrence because this would sound ridiculous. Those patients had such a short follow-up due to the bad behavior after the managing of the perforation that did not have the time to, to, to show any, any recurrence. You agree, Marilis? So... The conclusion that this is not related to any uh, recurrence is, in my opinion, not uh, uh, correct. I would simply say that those patients are actually those that behave very worse. And this is the curve that shows complicated versus uncomplicated patients only related to stented patients. So the issue is we have to prevent perforation, and this requires training and requires, of course, some technology advancement in stenting but we know that we can provide to these patients a lower rate of stoma in general, and also after stoma reversal, still there is a, um, a much lower rate of stomas in the, in the stented group patients, although the small numbers here do not allow any statistical significance, obviously. There is the same rate of reintervention between the two groups. There is the same rate of incisional hernia at one year, follow-up minimum in the two groups. So what to do with this data? Well, I wanted to spread it out, and unfortunately I could not change recommendations so far, so the only thing I could do was to mix all together these data with the existing literature of randomized trials, and this was published already one year ago on gastrointestinal endoscopy, another great honor for me. Eight randomized trials analyzed, Characteristic of patients are absolutely overlap, overlapping in, in all the eight uh, studies. And as I said before, two of those studies 
were stopped by the ethical committees due to the uh, uh, preference for results in the emergency surgery group compared to one study that instead was stopped for a clear evidence in favor of stenting. Characteristic of patients, as I mentioned before, absolutely overlapping. As all surgical trials in general, uh, the quality of the trials is very poor, but we have to stand with it. What about results? Mortality is absolutely the same in the two groups if you make a meta-analysis of that, 10% in both groups. What about mobility? Absolutely in favor of the stenting group, 30% uh, versus 50%. And this is the same also for temporary stoma, 30% to 50%, and to definitive stoma that is even worse, 20% to 35% more or less, and primary anastomosis too. And if you pull all the data together, of course, the problem of recurrence rises again. Um, you see here a slightly uh, a higher incidence of recurrences in the stenting group, 40% compared to, to 25, 26, but actually this does not reach any statistical significance. We will see in the future. So what are my conclusions of all this? Well, you might know that we are awaiting since now about one year now uh, the results, the published results of the CREST study, which is a huge study, uh, more than double of the ESCO study that has been performed in the UK. This should have enrolled 400 patients, and according to what are the rumors, only 246 actually were analyzed in the end. Many centers participated to the study, so I'm afraid that even here we will have a problem in uh, uh, correct performing of the stenting procedure, which is crucial to avoid perforation, which was the problem that uh, caused those very bad results uh, in the Dutch trial. But what rumors are is that at one year, the oncologic results are absolutely overlapping. We will need to see. It is uh, an absolute uh, uh, honor for me to see that thanks to the ESCO study, the NCCN guidelines were changed at the beginning of this year, and now they include again the opportunity, the possibility to stent these patients uh, in a bridge to surgery uh, fashion, thanks to the results that I showed to you before. What are the next steps? Waiting for the CREST study published. The second is uh, I initiated already with colleagues, Janine Van Oft, and also with people participating to the CREST study, an IPD, an individual patient database, because I want to understand which are the subgroups that really fail oncologically in performing uh, a stent bridge to surgery uh, procedure. And the third thing is that we will rewrite the ESG guidelines starting from September. I hope they will be published already in March as we planned next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.